Awesome. So I'm joined today by David Loy. Uh, welcome to the podcast, David. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. I am as well. Your work has been utterly fascinating to me in the last few months that I've really dove into it. And I can't wait to That's dive. That's a great in. way to start. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, what's really fascinating me about your work these days is you seem to have this thread of this sense of lack throughout all of your books, and especially the one that I've read um, and with the subtitle, subtitle studies in lack. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to just, yeah, get a sense of how you're understanding this sense of lack. We can, from what I understand is like modern culture seems to be driven by this sense of lack. We're always trying to uh, make ourselves feel whole. And there's always like this sense of like not enoughness or this sense of like this hole that we're trying to fill in almost, in almost everyone I meet and everyone I talk to, there's this like not enoughness or this like striving to, 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 to fill something. Um, and, and, and then going out in the world and acquiring things and consumerism and all of these ways to try to fill it, which never seemed to actually do the trick. Um, and so it feels really interesting to dive into what this lack actually is. And a lot of your work seems to center around that. Um, and so anything that feels relevant uh, regarding, I would love to hear your thoughts on like, what, like, what is the nature of this lack? Like what, what actually is it? And is there any perspectives that you're, that you have on it that feel especially pertinent? Hmm. Well, that, that's a big plum of a question. Uh, <laughs> and uh uh, in order to answer, I, I have to sort of create a little bit of context, because for me, the concept of lack has developed out of my Buddhism, both my Buddhist practice. I'm a, I'm a longtime uh, Zen student and sometimes Buddhist teacher. I'm also, I've been fortunate to have as a career, a career as a basically professor of Buddhist philosophy. So they kind of worked very nicely together. I was very lucky, you know. I mean, when you, so... As I said, for me, the concept of lack comes out of Buddhism, and in particular, Buddhism is very much preoccupied with what's called dukkha, which is dissatisfaction. It's the word usually translated into, into English as suffering, but that only really works if we understand it in the broad sense, right? You know, dissatisfaction, mm -hmm. frustration, uh, anxiety, dis-ease, that, that kind of thing. The Buddha himself said that all he had to teach was dukkha and how to end it. Uh, and for me, what's really fascinating and I think essential is the connection that Buddhism makes between this dukkha and the delusion of a separate self. So that's the other really kind of counterintuitive teaching of Buddhism that, the, that, there, that there is no separate self. Uh, in, in more modern language, our usual sense of separate self is a, a psychological and social construct, right? It's not something that infants are born with, for example. So mm -hmm. they, they, they learn that uh, as they grow up, they're socialized. Uh, our caregivers look into our eyes and say our name, and we learn to see ourselves in the way that they see us. So anyway, the sense of self is kind of internalized. But here's, here's where the lack comes from. Because the sense of self is a construct, it means it doesn't have any sort of ability of its own. In Buddhist terms, we could say that the sense of self is composed of basically mostly habitual ways of thinking and feeling and acting and remembering and planning. And it, it's the way these processes, mostly mental processes, like work together and that they are what create and sustain this this sense of separate self um and because there is no nothing no sort of pure eye pure consciousness behind it it means that the the sense of self is inherently um insecure it's you know it's not the sense of self is there, but the self that supposedly is behind it all, that doesn't exist, okay? doesn't have any reality. It's, it's like a function or, 
a way a bunch of processes work together. And what that means is, therefore, that the, the sense of self is uh, haunted by a, a dissatisfaction. Uh, and we become aware of that as a sense of lack. I would say, yeah, the other, if you think about it as a coin, like our usual sense of self is like one side of a coin and it's the other side of that is this sense of lack, which mm -hmm. simply means insufficiency, inadequacy, um, um, I'm not good enough. And as you pointed out at the beginning, this is a really common experience. In fact, it has to be common if, if what we're saying is true. It, it's part of our human condition, right? Mm -hmm. And but but how we understand that sense of lack is going to vary a lot according to our situation. So uh, you were earlier talking about a book. I don't I, I don't remember now if we were talking about it before or you flashed it in your intro, but a book called The Buddhist History of the West, and it talks about how that sense of lack has been understood in different ways historically, like. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the sense of lack explains a great deal about the attraction of religion. Because you could say religion promises us that our sense of lack uh, will be fulfilled if we believe what we're told to believe and if we do what we're what we're told to do. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting in the modern world where that religious promise is less powerful for a lot of us, where we're especially in the US, we're so much more individualistic, you could say, because we're so individualistic, there's a stronger sense of self and therefore a stronger sense of, of lack, of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. And the individualism means we can't depend on the religious belief. We can't depend on the church to fill it for us. We have to solve it by ourselves. And so I think some of the main ways that sense of lack comes out for us today, especially you know contemporary USA, is uh, the feeling that uh, we don't have enough money. Now, of course, for some people that's true. I, I don't mean to minimize that, but even for people who have enough or a lot of money, that's kind of built into the way that we're socialized in this country. In a way, it doesn't matter how much you have, right? You know, somehow you need more money. And mm -hmm. the irony is because that desire for money is just a symptom of the fundamental problem, it doesn't matter how much money you get, it's not gonna resolve that fundamental problem at the core of our being. That sense of lack is still gonna fester because addressing the symptom doesn't actually get to the heart of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I've been feeling that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how much, how inescapable it feels. At least that's my experience in, in these days is like, <laughs> you know, looking for a place of my own and trying to pay rent and this, this sense of not having enough money is like so built into the culture, it feels like. And it's like, I notice myself like justifying not meditating or not like just sitting and being because I'm like, well, I need to make more money. And so there's almost this like, it's like this movement away from, from just sit, sitting with, you know, meditation in the sense and like understanding what this sense of lack is. And yeah, so I think I would love to to dive a little bit into this before we go into like uh, the non-duality kind of Buddhist uh, solution to lack. I would love to go into yeah how this lack is playing out in modern culture and how and how religion plays. And I think you were kind of touching on it a little bit. I think there's a couple of threads that we could pull here. Yeah. Uh, you know, religion seems less and less appealing today, and it seems. But then, if I conventional religion, yeah conventional yeah. conventional religion and it seems like if i try to inhabit the religious perspective it almost seems like it's it's pointing to something very valid that modern culture is focused on greed uh like focus like focus on all of these ways of overcoming lack that don't work but then when i inhabit the the modern uh individualistic perspective it feels like well i can't really go back to religion it doesn't feel like that's an option um and so i think i think uh there's something here around how 
you talked about in your book, The Buddhist History of the West, how the, mo the modern market is a religion in and of itself. And I think actually naming that and going into that could be really interesting, uh, how, how we feel that we've gotten away from religion. But then you talk about how this modern market, this, this free market capitalist system is in essence a religion. It's the religion of individualization, atomism. Um, and then you go into a bit of how it's destroying community values as well, how we're kind of seeing um, it, the, the kind of conception of self is that we're all completely separate from everyone else and that the only kind of uh, valid type of relationship is like transactional um, contractual relationships and that we it's almost harder to feel just genuine relationship for its own sake um in, in in just like really basking in the beauty of relationship because it's all been reduced to transactional relationships um and so i would love to hear your thoughts on kind of this religion of the market this religion of 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 you know scientific materialism capitalism consumerism <laughs> whatever big, uh, issues. <laughs> big, big issues but but especially around like yeah how it's it's we see it just as how the world works, but it seems to be a religion that we're not, we're not really seeing it as the, there's a fundamental belief system that that's underwriting all of sort of culture. Well, that's a big agenda. <laughs> let, let, me, uh, let me just preface going back to something you said earlier, how you're like, you were talking about your own situation, um, needing to earn more money. And, and I want to emphasize again, there are plenty of people, and you may well be one, in this country who don't have enough money. I mean, and I don't mean to minimize that. We're, we have, compared to other modern developed societies, such as the people in Europe, we have a pretty awful social system in that it's much harder. Uh, we don't have the kind of social services. We don't have the national health care system that every other developed nation I can think of has for everyone, not just for old folks like me, you know, we get uh, Medicare. Um, so it's really important not to minimize that. I think the split between rich and poor in this country is already obscene and getting much worse. And I don't want anything I say to, you know, take attention or, or to deny the, the importance of that. The other thing I'd want to emphasize, and maybe we can get into this later if you want, we're, we are focusing on money, and uh, I guess uh, we could include in that sort of consumerism generally, but there are other types of really important lack projects that are worth mentioning, and we might want to get into them. For example, fame. I, uh, I think that that's a, a huge one, especially in the past couple generations, in a way that it wasn't in the past. So maybe we can reserve that for the moment. But but going back to Buddhism, and, and again, I'm sort of coming out of Buddhism. Buddhism doesn't talk about good versus evil, right? That's not the Buddhist way of looking at the world. Buddhism talks a lot more about ignorance and delusion, and we don't see things as they really are, and what we need is wisdom. Uh, and uh, sort of awakening to the true nature of things. But, but when you unpack that, what Buddhism tends to focus on is what's called three poisons or three fires that cause problems for us. Uh, greed, ill will, and delusion. And in particular, greed is the kind of one that we're zooming in on now, because if, if greed means that you, you never have enough, then I think that's a pretty good description of our economic system. You know, that, that goes back to this lack project of always f needing more money. And I think that tends to be built into us uh, by the way, for, for example, advertising works, right? If you think about advertising, it's, it's basically about convincing us that we don't have enough, convincing us that we're not happy or we shouldn't be happy now. But the next thing we buy will make us happy. So we get, and, and in fact, it, it really seems to me uh, the religion of the market you alluded to, but I might even want to say the religion of consumerism. Because if religion is what purports to teach us, you know, what's really real and important and how we should live in the world, I think for an awful lot of people, uh, 
including many ostensibly religious people, I, I, I think consumerism is, is a pretty good un understanding of, you know, what motivates us to do most of what we do, what we do these days. And, and it's important to see how something new has happened in the, in the last century or so. Um, the three poisons, like greed, ill will, delusion, they've become institutionalized. And in particular, our reference to money and the market, I think, uh, is a good example of that. As, as we said, if greed means you never have enough, well, isn't that describing the fact that our economic system has to keep growing if it's not going to collapse? You know, corporations, they always want more profitability, bigger market share, higher stock prices, and it doesn't matter how much of them you have, you can always have more, right? You always want more. And so it's not simply a matter of individuals being greedy, I think it's actually built into the system. Corporations are responsible, they're owned by the stockholders and they have to return, uh, you know, benefits um, uh, uh, for uh, the fact that they're owned by stockholders means that, you know, they're the ones who, who deserve and expect the, the results of that. Uh, so we, we have a serious economic problem. It's not just as Buddhism would traditionally talk about. It's not just an individual problem. It's kind of built into the way that our society works, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's so, yeah, it's, it feels so apparent as you're describing it, how like almost everything around us is like this, this driven from this place of lack and it almost feels um yeah inescapable in some ways and and you you talk about this a little bit in your book how like billions and billions and billions of dollars are being thrown into advertising and and as you're talking about this what what i was what came up for me was how do i how do i do something different how do i not let myself get super affected by advertising by this this religion of of consumerism and it's like it's not exactly apparent to me because i'm engaging with the internet and there's advertisements everywhere there's consu like consumerism has gotten into the media you know where it's like youtube in all like just like consuming more and more content and it's like i get sucked into it so so easily and and I, I've just been thinking about like, how do I actually like take a stand against that? It feels like a very radical, radical thing. And towards the end of your book, you were talking a little bit about that, how the axial age was this radical re, uh, reframe of, of transcendence and, and, and overcoming lack. And almost, we almost need something of equal proportion to that today, which I was like, well, that really hit me as, whoa, like it, we do need this like radical, almost revolution of like how we're seeing lack or how we're engaging with the world and where we're coming from, from which place we're choosing to participate and engage with the world from. And it just feels like, like sometimes I wonder it, sometimes I feel small, like, is there anything I can do to, to counteract this, this, the momentum of it seems like our entire culture from this place of lack. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you're framing that. Like, how are you framing what, what is there to do in, in terms of counteracting it? Or how do we live in a way individually that, that tries to not come from this place of lack? So, so great question. And, and, and there's a couple of different dimensions to it, you know, um, I think we need to start with ourselves as as individuals accepting our individuality in in the sense that uh, you know lack is something that is connected with the way that we think the way that we understand ourselves the way we function and what's important about something like Buddhism and and I don't want to say that Buddhism is the only way but Buddhism for me is an especially good model of how it is that a spiritual tradition can help us address this, right? And how does it do it? Well, in Buddhism, we emphasize a lot uh, changing our lifestyle, being less consumerist, being happy with simplicity. 
But, but the reason that's possible is that Buddhism is fundamentally about understanding how our minds work. And we learn that from meditation, right? So, um, in a way, I, I sometimes think of Buddhism as another kind of lack project, but it's a lack project that can work as opposed to making money or becoming famous as lack projects where you can never have enough. For some people, Buddhism can be a lack project. You know, you think, uh, oh, if I meditate, I'm going to become a Buddha and how cool that will be, whatever. But the basic idea uh, is um, because the sense of lack is the shadow of the sense of self, if we can forget, as Dogen puts it, or let go of our, our sense of self, then in a way we see through and let go the sense of lack. What I mean by that is uh, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest of, of the Japanese Zen uh, teachers, uh, Dogen, he really summarized the, the, the path very nicely when he said, quote, uh, to study the Buddha Dharma is to study the self. Study in this, not in the academic sense, but sort of inquire into, right? Look into. To study the Buddha Dharma is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self, right? And then to forget the self is to realize your intimacy with all things. So basically what, what, what he's pointing out is the fundamental issue is this delusion of separation right? That there's a me inside that's somehow separate from you and separate from everyone else. And this separate self has some sort of reality. And rather by meditation, in the meditation, we can learn to sort of forget ourselves, to become so one with the meditation that we lose the sense of the self that's doing the meditation. Anyway, there, there, there's a lot we could talk about there, but the basic idea is meditation is a way to let go of this delusive sense of separate self and realize our non-duality. It's like, whoa, when I see through that there's no me that's separate from all this, really, that what I understand as myself, I'm just one of the ways that all of this is manifesting, then it tends to cut through this these lack projects this preoccupation with self you know i don't have to try to make myself real because in in the most important sense there's no me separate from from you and from everyone else and that's a pretty powerful transformation you know as long as we have this separate sense of self this delusive sense of separate self uh, there's always going to be discomfort like we said and to some degree we're always, always going to be sort of preoccupied with the future, with trying to get somewhere better than we are now. And that's part of the problem is this sort of future orientation. Whereas if we can let go of ourselves, then we can realize what we're looking for is actually right here and now. And right here and now, there's nothing lacking from the very beginning. Although, as I said earlier, maybe some people do need somewhat more money, but in the fundamental sense, there's nothing lacking about my world right here and now. And that, that there's a kind of a liberation, there's a kind of a letting go, there's a kind of a freedom. Instead of the kind of self-preoccupation of, you know, what's in it for me in every situation, there's a kind of a turning around and because we don't feel separate from other people and separate from the world, then we can go and we can ask, well, uh, I'm free, but how do I naturally want to live in a way that wants to make this a better world for all of us? And then that kind of transformation, I think, gets at the heart of what Buddhism is talking about. And I, I would say any genuine spiritual path, and it involves cutting through, letting go of these lack projects and, uh, finding, uh, being motivated by something quite different. It's, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, there, there are a couple things coming up for me. One is, I, as you're talking, I'm trying to get the sense of holding, like sometimes we do actually need more money to survive like on a very practical level like there's almost like this not wanting to throw it out 
for the sake of uh, throwing out the lack project, but like we live in this society that is that is motivated by lack. So in some yeah. senses, as long as we're living, inhabiting this world, we have to engage with it to some degree in order to survive. And so I'm like, what is this middle ground of going through the motions of, 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 of making money, but on an individual level, not fully being motivated by this lack at the same time? Like, what is this way of, of engaging with a culture of lack from a place that is not lack. Um, that that's kind of what's going through my mind that's as you're good, good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And from my own life, that's kind of what I'm contemplating. And, right. and um, I want to add one thing, which is like, sometimes when I'm like trying, like meditating and trying to like get like, what does it mean that the sense of self is illusory? Like that's something I've sat with for a while and it's still like, it still baffles me. Like I can't, haven't fully grokked what it means to, that the sense of self is an illusion, but, but sometimes I get this sense of, and, and you wrote this in your book, you said Buddhist awakening occurs when I realize that I am not other than the world. I am what the world is doing right here, right now. And sometimes like I get this, this subtle sense of like the world is just, life is just doing something through me and I'm not actually in control of it at all it's just kind of doing its thing and so i'm wondering i'm wondering how you would frame that like is is there a way to like yeah engage like make money in a way where life is just doing what it is and i'm i'm not actually the one that's like in control of the of the whole game so to speak or or like what is that middle ground yeah yeah good G good question um couple different ways to go there or a couple different things to say yeah the first one is you know the problem the, the heart of the problem isn't that you know we we live I'm trying to think of the best way to say this you know buddhism talks about delusion and that we don't realize the way things really are and and often this is presented as um the what's called the phenomenal world and so that that's the world as we usually experience it the relative world you're you and i'm me and i'm here and i'm in this room with all kinds of books and all kinds of other stuff and uh you know we we were you and i were born at different times different places and we live and for a certain number of years and then we'll pass away later on and so this this usual way of understanding the world it's not it's not wrong but it's simply one-sided it's it's incomplete and as buddhism emphasized there's this dukkha this dissatisfaction built into it because we have this sense of a separate self that it never feels real never feels quite comfortable or complete or whole right uh, and so what 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 a real spiritual path is is talking about is saying well there's this other side to reality there's this other way of experiencing and it's not as though that other way of experiencing is completely denying our usual way of experiencing because we have to function right uh, in order to function in this world you've got to have a bank account maybe a credit card uh, you've got to get to certain places at a certain time and uh, the, the guy who works is the same guy who gets the money at the end of the day it's like all of that is necessary but the whole point of a spiritual path is to say well there's there's something else going on here there's this other way of experiencing the world and it's not simply a matter of rejecting our usual way of experiencing and you know um, just simply embracing this this alternative but realizing that there are these two perspectives as it were these two ways and the real challenge it's not just to get some glimpse or insight into this other dimension or other perspective rather which is called you know enlightenment or awakening whatever it's not just to get that but it's to deepen that but also to integrate it in how we live day to day and day to day of course guess what you and i need a certain amount of money so uh that's acceptable 
that's that's necessary. We live in that kind of economy, uh, and in order to function and be happily, we have to accept it and be able to play that game to a certain extent. The problem, to say it again, is when we think that's the only thing going on, and there's this other this other side to it. You alluded to the axial age, which is a, a particular kind of transformation that happened around the time of the Buddha. It's, it's in the first millennium BCE, right? And the Buddha maybe four or five hundred years before Jesus, before Christ, right? So, and there, so these new kinds of religions came along. And, you know, there's a lot to say about them. Buddhism is one example, but also the Abrahamic Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that's another kind of tradition. In a way, there was something very wonderful about them because they emphasized, among other things, uh, universal compassion, at least in principle. You think about Jesus and um, uh, the Good Samaritan, or think about the Buddha who talked about a metta meditation where you feel goodwill ultimately for everyone and for everything, right? But the problem they got into is they, they ended up talking about some kind of other reality that we might go to after we die, right? Like heaven or for, for a lot of Buddhists, whether this is a correct understanding or not, you know, nirvana, right? And the attraction of that, of course, is that um, it, it does address our fear of death, right? in a way the religions a lot of the power there that traditional religious institutions have is you know they're telling us we don't really die and that's something we really want to hear and they say not only that but if you do what you're told you can go to heaven and you can spend an eternity with god wow you know that's pretty powerful stuff but here here's the here's where the problem happens is it tends to devalue this world here and now as simply a means to that end. So in a way, this world has value only because it's if we treat it in the right way, if we treat other people in the right way, we're going to qualify for this immortality, you see. Um, and so when we look at the kind of ecological crisis we have now, uh, I think we can understand ultimately it, it very much is connected with this long-term devaluation of this world. We tend to think of all the other species and the earth in general, all its ecosystems as simply means to human ends. They don't have any value, any meaning, any uh, importance in and of themselves, except insofar as they serve our species, which is bloody crazy if you think about it. You know, everything is here just for this one species. Well, no, no wonder we're messing every, everything up. But here's, here's the important point. I, I, I was really struck recently when I came across something Joseph Campbell said. Um, he was the guy who studied mythology. And he said, uh, a lot of the problems occur in religion because we take metaphors literally. We take metaphors and um, uh, mythologies literally. And I think the essential one the essential problem is when we think about transcendence. <coughs> I think the big mistake is, and this is a mistake fundamental to a lot of religious people and religious institution, a, a, a lot of the mistake is we think that what we have to do is transcend this world. And the point about Buddhism, I think, if it's really understood right, or the spirituality generally, what we need to transcend is not this world, go to some other reality or Mars with Elon Musk, whatever. What we need to do is not transcend this world, but to transcend our usual way of experiencing it, which is what something like meditation and Buddhist enlightenment can help us do, you know, to realize that our usual way of experiencing the world, it's, it's created by the way our mind works. And if our mind transforms, then the world we live in, the way we experience it, that's going to transform. And, and I think once we really get that point, then things can really begin to change, both individually and collectively, hopefully, for our civilization. 
Yeah, it's so fascinating to me. Um, the Buddhist, what like try what the Buddhist pursuit is. I, I spent some time like what what is actually the pursuit of Buddhism, mm. and I think you wrote about this in one of your texts. I think you quoted um, one of the big Buddhist figures. I can't remember his name, but something on um, nothingness and somethingness. And how basically seeing into Buddhist truth is not seeing the world, it's, it's that the world doesn't change, but that our lens on it does, or like nothing fundamentally changes, but at the same time, everything changes. I, that was something that stood out to me. And I'm like, all right, what does it mean to like look at the world and not trying to change it, but trying to see it differently or trying to break through some delusion or some mental deception that I have that is blocking me from seeing it as it is it feels like a very interesting interesting pursuit and, and, and especially like yeah seeing through some sort of de the delusions or this delusion of lack or this delusion of um, yeah like trying to realize myself in the world and something was coming up as you were speaking about the religion point which was there seems to be with this um pursuit of heaven or other world or like immortality it's like this like putting it off into the distance somehow and it's like it's like i'm gonna do i'm gonna suffer now and i'm gonna i'm gonna be in the lack for my mm -hmm. whole life and then when i die the lack will go away because that, that's a religious promise the way many people understand it that's right yep right right and 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 i noticed myself i've never been a super religious person i kind of was raised in a sort of atheist lens or like a modern scientific lens mm -hmm. so i haven't really but i've noticed myself doing the same thing i've been um in 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 the beginning of one of your books i think lack and transcendence you talk about uh ernest becker and like the denial of death and how that still is almost putting it off like there's this fear of death and and i've framed my kind of existential fears as fear of death as fear of non-existence. Um, and you and what I found fascinating was this reframe that you did, a fear of not being real right now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that would be something interesting to dive into how that, because that seems to relate with lack very intimately. There's this- Oh, oh I think so, yeah. What lack, what it seems like this desire for, uh, for business, business growth, for, for consumerism is like to not to avoid this possibility that I could not be real right now. Yeah, th there for me, there was a kind of interesting sequence of things um, that happened um, that led to this realization about sense of lack. Uh, and for me, it started uh, at a certain point in my life, I think back in the 30s, when I became really fascinated by by death and, you know, uh, a, an existential sense, uh, trying to understand death. And I, I was meditating a lot at that point. I was living in Japan, working with this, my Zen master. And, but I was also reading everything I could, not only in Buddhism, but other religions, psychology, philosophy. And the most interesting thing that I came across that really was very powerful, very transformative, was Ernest Becker, who wrote this Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Denial of Death. And basically, Becker was doing something really fascinating. He, in a way, he was criticizing Freud. You know, Freud is, for many people now, he's a little bit dated. Um, but he had this really important concept of repression, right? And for him, the important repression was sexual desire, sexual feeling. And for him, a lot of modern civilization was we, you know, we repress a lot of our sexual desire. Well, maybe in his Victorian times, people did. I'm not so sure that's true. But the idea of repression is you repress something. And as Freud pointed out, the repression doesn't really work in the sense that the, what is repressed tends to come out anyway. It kind of leaks out. There's what he called the return of the repressed in a sort of disguised form of a symptom. So like for Freud, he, he was dealing with a lot of women who seemed to have what were called hysterical symptoms, hysterical in a clinical sense. And 
what he traced it back to kind of repression of sexual desire, which at that time women weren't supposed to have or women weren't supposed to feel so strongly. What was so powerful about Ernest Becker, he said, well, actually the fundamental repression, there is repression, but the fundamental repression is our fear of death. That we really can't fully accept our mortality, that we're going to die, and so we repress it. But tragically, to repress death, feelings of death, our awareness of death is also in a way to repress life. And uh, we're unable to live fully because of that fear. And um, the repression, again, according to Becker, it leaks out. There's a return of the repress in that people become preoccupied with immortalizing themselves. Uh, and uh, even it's like fame. Be great to write a bunch of books that'll live long after I'm dead. So David Loy's name will live on. Uh, but but even money can be kind of a symbolic, it can represent life, uh, even though we know we can't take it with us. I think a lot of people don't think that far ahead, and there's a, still a kind of a grasping, right? Uh, grasping here and now. So I think Becker was really on to something very powerful, but then I realized from a Buddhist point of view, the problem really isn't just death which is going to happen to us sometime in the future. The problem is right here and now that the sense of self doesn't have any separate reality, that it's inherently insubstantial, incomplete, and therefore uncomfortable. And so lack projects are simply the return of the repressed in that sense, that, you know, at, at, at some sense we feel this inadequacy and so we grasp we kind of grasp at something and we think only if i'm rich and if i'm just rich enough if i'm just famous enough if i'm powerful enough if i'm sexy enough um, if i have enough consumer toys uh, if my body is perfect enough this was especially true i think for women you know they're they're taught to identify more with their bodies i think it's happening to men too but uh, traditionally women, you know, uh, it's a very important part of their sense of self as often in internalized for them is the sense that, you know, they've got to be really uh, um, sexy and, and attractive. And so that becomes their lack project. And uh, so it comes out in all different kinds of ways and we haven't had an opportunity to explore all of them by any means, but, the point being, the less we're motivated, the, the less we accept the old traditional religious idea that if we just behave ourselves, then our lack will be resolved after we die. If we don't believe that anymore, then it's going to make our lack projects here and now more manic, more crazy, more obsessive. And to be honest, I think that's a pretty good description about what's happening, you know. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does seem like the manicness of the world is speeding up or the the or the mental health crisis or this or some call the meaning crisis. It's like it's so hard to find direction and meaning in. in can can I interrupt there? Because that, that's so important. Um, very important part of lack projects is this future orientation right? Now isn't good enough, but in the future, when I have what I think I need, everything's going to be okay. I'll, I'll feel fine. I grew up post-war, post-World War II, right? And we believed in something then that's a lot harder to believe in, progress, right? Growing up in the 50s and 60s, the world was our oyster, you know? It's like mm -hmm. big, economic growth, so many more opportunities for for jobs and going to college and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the kind of belief that, you know, the world is getting better. And that future orientation, it's, it's, uh, it, it developed a certain type of psychological structure that I think is very hard now. I think for young people now, including you and younger people as well, it's very hard to believe in progress. Um, it, it, uh, econ I mean, 
not only economic, but most of all, of course, ecological, it looks really grim. Things seem to be starting to fall apart in a number of ways. If you don't believe in progress, then you can't believe in the future. And I think that's, that's pretty terrifying. And I think that's at the heart of, of a lot of this sort of panic and, and lack projects and, and mental crisis and people acting out with guns and so, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with no future, what do we do? It's, it, there are problems with growing up now, say be, being a teenager now, totally different than what it was like for me being a teenager back in the 60s, you know, even with the Vietnam War. Mm. Yeah, it is, it is fascinating to me to see this resistance against progress or this, I've noticed it in myself working nine to five jobs and I'm like, why? So I, my whole life is the bottom line, increasing the bottom line for this one company. Like that, I can't, I can't get behind that. And like, I feel like my soul is like getting destroyed when I do that. And I'm like, I can't possibly fathom that, th that I could do this my whole life. And I think maybe that's how it, it shows up, but also, also, yeah, I'm like, am, are there going to be, there is this threat of, you know, all of these potential existential civilization risks in that and like, all right, so therefore, then I ask myself, therefore, is my goal to like, stop these things from happening, and then that becomes my new goal or something, but it, but it also feels that just as just as hazy. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to uh, double click on the the denial of death, the the fear of not being real, because there's this sense that I get of how difficult it is to accept groundlessness. Mm. When, when I sit with, if I'm not real or when I like, I'm doing all of these things to try to become more real in the world, I'm working for all these companies, I'm doing all these projects, maybe I have a fame drive, a bit of a money drive. And it's like it to become like real. And then when I, when I sit with, the deeper I've got into when I've sat with that, then the opposite of it feels like this groundlessness that's like utterly terrifying in some senses. In a lot of ways, I've I've become utterly terrified by this groundlessness. And in trying to sit with this groundlessness has been really difficult for me. And I've noticed myself when I start feeling this groundlessness, I will like react and go even stronger contract. The, that's right yeah. contract and go even stronger into the trying to become real project um yeah. and some of the stuff you've written seems to be that from how i understand it is that buddhism almost helps us accept groundlessness and find meaning in 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 like not see ground there's almost a sense that in our modern way in our modern culture groundlessness or nothingness is seen as this awful terrible dark void or something nihilistic or something yeah nihilistic yeah and when, when yeah. i've when i've like yeah. touched this groundlessness a little bit it has such a nihilistic mm -hmm. flavor to it which maybe is related to these cultural forces and so i'm i'm very curious to explore like in in from can you talk more about how potentially groundlessness doesn't have to be this nihilistic thing, or there's potentially a way to be in this groundless, no thingness or no self. Yeah. It's not, that's not nihilistic or, or dark or bleak. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's what we experience you often as groundlessness, actually what it, what it really leads to in in something like buddhism is a different kind of groundedness in the whole it's like we can't this separate the sense of separate ego self that can't it you can understand that as preoccupied and this is another way of describing lack projects right it's it's not feeling real enough we're always trying to ground ourselves and it never feels like we're grounded enough and uh, the so then the way to understand the process, letting go of ourselves, which is what Dogen talked about, right? Forgetting, forgetting the self. It's as it were falling into the void or, or sort of uh, 
falling, letting go into what we're afraid of, what we initially experience as as a kind of a groundlessness, right? Um, Chogyam Trungpa really put it very well when when he said, uh, "Enlightenment is like falling out of an airplane. Uh, the bad news is there's no parachute." Right, no lack projects, for example. The good news is there's no ground. <laughs> you know, it's like there's there's that there's not the fear of crashing into something, but there's a kind of you know liberation uh, that that we're 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 not uh, we don't need to play those those games anymore. I think that's the really important thing. And what you described of in meditation as the sense of sort of beginning to maybe starting to open up and maybe even sort of beginning to forget oneself and then the, a sense of the groundlessness and a certain kind of gut level contraction kind of a you know and that's 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 not at all uncommon and uh basically in the meditation that's something that often one has to go through. It's like you meditate and that process happens and then meditate and that process, you know, and at a certain point, you know, there, there's a kind of a dialectic here that going the back and forth, but at a certain point we learn just to kind of let go and, and accept that void, that emptiness, that, that thing, that groundlessness that we're afraid of. And then something happens, and it turns out it's not so bad as we thought it was. That there's, in fact, we did that that whole process of opening contraction is just kind of a game the ego is playing, and ultimately one doesn't have to play that game, and ultimately nothing important is important is is lost in in the process. So, um, I think I know where you're coming from there, and uh, yeah, ground, groundlessness. Just, just to say it again, in a way, we don't need to ground ourselves from the very beginning. That's what we don't know, because we're, we're grounded in all this. We're, it, it's the whole, it's all of this that's manifesting in us, as us, through us. And that's everything we need, ultimately. And so the, the, there's this incredible sense of freedom and liberation, because then one doesn't need to play those games anymore. Yeah, I almost get this sense of, I'm also kind of tracking how, at least for myself, and I imagine for other people, sometimes the Buddhist language may be hard to connect with the Western language a bit. And I almost had this sense of like, how that might be interpreted. Like, I've heard a lot of people say, just trusting life or just trust like like fully just having trust and not mm. i don't know i have this sense that there's like people may in western culture may be trying to get at maybe the same thing but using slightly yeah, different language. words yeah. just trusting life or yeah. just rendering that everything's gonna work out i almost sense is is this like the same thing as like everything is groundless like the like life itself is the ground or like existence itself is the ground um you, you know uh, the yeah the we we cannot ground ourselves you know for a couple different reasons one of them is there, there's no separate self that could ever, ever be grounded, and and there's and there's nothing that needs to be gained. Therefore, but there is still these delusions and this kind of grasping quality, right? As long as we feel separate, the tendency is to sort of grasp at something to kind of stabilize or, or ground ourselves. And 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 the way enlightenment works, it's like we can't let go of ourselves consciously in the way that you can't pull you can't levitate by pulling on your shoestrings right it doesn't work like that it's sort of the whole point of meditation is that it addresses it in an indirect way where we meditate and when we're meditating you know the the usual processes that 
constitute the sense of self, right? The habitual ways of thinking and feeling and grasping, all of those kind of come to mind. And but if we're not, but if we're meditating and we're we're not holding on to them, they'll kind of arise and they'll pass away. And in that process, you could say the sense of self is deconstructing. It's not that I am consciously doing it, but by focusing on the meditation theme, uh, by focusing on that, when those things tend to come to mind, then uh, they just naturally go away. There's not that kind of holding on to them that we would normally do and responding and acting on them. So there's that meditation process. The actual process of awakening, though, um, that, that again, that's not something I do. It's something that just happens kind of non-dually. As someone said, I think it was uh, Shinri Suzuki, he said, you know, enlightenment is always an accident, but meditation can make you accident prone, you know? So th that that's how the process works, is when we're meditating, in a way, we are deconstructing, degrounding uh, ourselves, and then if if we're uh, devoted to that practice, then at certain times things th just happen in and of themselves, and then we're we're free of of that kind of grasping quality where we need to, and and then even after that, usually like in Zen we emphasize kensho. It's just a glimpse, just a taste, maybe just for a few seconds or minutes, but and then we tend to sort of fall back into the old patterns, the clinging and the dualities. Uh, but by continuing the practice, we can deepen that and integrate it uh, so that we embody that more and more in daily life and how we actually live. Sorry, I'm going on and on a bit here. No worries. Um, I'm actually very interested. Yeah, meditation as a way of, as you're speaking, I, guess I was getting this sense of something was clicking when you were saying like the self is composed of all these habitual patterns of like, I need to plan this. I need to plan for the future. I need to, and it's like, it's like always like doing stuff and planning. And there's almost this sense of like where, like a um, note, I almost get the sense that meditation is like noticing what the energy is that's giving rise to that planning like why do i feel that i need to plan so much why do i need feel that i need to control so much um but on a on a slightly different note i'm very curious about your experience in japan like how was how was um i imagine there was lots of meditation you were in monasteries i imagine and in, in no no I, I i had a teacher a japanese teacher that i first met in hawaii back in the early 70s i'm an old guy right so mm -hmm. Yamada Koen Roshi. He uh, he was he was the 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 spiritual director, the leader of what was called Sambo Kyodan, now Sambo Zen, and he but he's a layman. He was actually a retired businessman, so uh, it wasn't monastic. It was a lay practice. Uh, we would actually sit uh, in a zendo that had been built uh, next to his home, and uh, so I didn't have any monastic experience in Japan. It was I was. Most of the time I was there, I was uh, teaching in a Japanese university and, you know, writing some of those books. Um, uh, but just about every evening we would sit in 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 his zendo, and then we would do periodic uh, seshin and zazenkai and such. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still, I'm curious. Do you have any? like the progression for you, it sounds like you've been practicing for quite a while. And I'm curious what the progression is for you. Did you notice with meditation, like not attaching on to these habitual planning, mental patterns as much? Was it like kind of an instant thing of like instantly sort of becoming com uh, comfortable with groundlessness, like, like in a sort of jump, like sometimes in, in Zen, it's like, a, like a instant jump, or was it more like with time, you just notice did you notice that the mental patterns became less enticing slowly over like years? In the Buddhist tradition, interestingly, there's this, uh, that, that question is called the, you know, the dialogue or the debate between sudden enlightenment and gradual enlightenment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in my own experience, it was a bit of both. There were definitely moments, things that happened that really 
changed me. But both before and after, you know, in, in retrospect, it's clear how things were happening, changes were happening that could make an experience like that possible. And likewise, and often the, the greater challenge is sort of integrating that experience into how one actually lives day to day. I mean, I think this is often a problem in Buddhism, certainly in Zen, where people have an experience that, oh, now I'm enlightened. Well, so what? I mean, enlightenment and three dollars might buy you a cup of coffee if you go to the right place, right? But, uh, you know, the issue is, so what is it? What difference does it make in terms of how you actually relate to other people and and relate to the world? And, you know, this is a big question now. Um, um, recently, I'm focusing more and more on uh, ecological issues, what's called eco dharma. What are the implications of Buddhism for how we understand and respond to the ecological crisis and uh, the, the urgency of that, you know, not not just climate change, but loss of biodiversity, uh, toxic pollutants in the air and the earth and the water and our bodies, et cetera, et cetera. So this this is a really big, big concern. It's it's within the Buddhist tradition. There's this. Um, and it's emphasized, especially in Mahayana Buddhism, the idea of the bodhisattva path, that ultimately, you know, we want to follow this path and wake up not just for ourselves, but for everyone, that the ultimate motivation is to help everyone wake up. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If if enlightenment is about realizing our non-separation from other people, how can I be fully enlightened unless everyone else is enlightened too, right? So there's, there's a natural... I mean, at the, at the beginning, we come to Buddhism because there's some dissatisfaction in our own lives. So there's a certain kind of natural self preoccupation at the beginning. But, you know, the more we get into it, the more we see through the delusion of separation, the more we're concerned about what's happening with everyone. And today that involves very much the uh, the earth, right, the biosphere and, and what we're doing to that. And so I, I think that's a really important challenge for say the buddhist tradition like other spiritual traditions it's also a challenge for us individually you know i mean all mm -hmm. of us to some degree are shocked and uh, often grieving sometimes despairing about what's going on but the really important challenge is waking up in a way that helps us uh, or we naturally feel motivated to do what we can to address the kind of ecological crisis that that we're facing today mm. that's beautiful i wish we had another two hours to explore the ecological <laughs> implications um, maybe we've had enough for today yeah <laughs> maybe another time um yeah I, I find it fascinating when you reference indra's net a lot as as using that as a frame for for seeing this like if i'm not if i'm reflecting every other jewel in the net or if i'm if i'm not fully separate from all the other indra's net is fascinating to me because for a while it's hard for me to get like all right if i'm not separate from other people well, i still don't have access to their experiences so like it still feels a little hazy but i feel like indra's net is like oh there's these individual jewels but at the same time they're reflecting all of the other jewels um, and it feels, yeah. It's not denying our individuality, but at the same time, it's emphasizing that that individuality is interdependent with all of the other stuff going on, all of the other people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm very excited to explore your work on eco-dharma and in how to actually relate to this ecological crisis from a place of interdependence and well, <laughs> here I have to mention, you know, we started, I think both of us are in Boulder now, we started, uh, some of us, this Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Retreat Center uh, in the mountains of, above Boulder. So uh, we are starting to create and to lead what we call Ecodharma Retreats, which I think uh, are really important with, you know, they try to integrate Buddhist practice and teaching into the kind of ecological situation what what does buddhism mean for how we understand and respond to that ecological crisis and that i think that has become one of the really really important questions for us today yeah
Absolutely. And in, in a sense, I, it feels like we did cover a little bit of the eco Dharma stuff in that I imagine. And I think in the book, uh, Buddhist history of the West, there's this sense that a lot of the ecological crises are this lack project in the, in the pursuit of money and externalizing nature in the process. And so it feels like we have a good foundation now. And yeah. I think we could say that if you look at our civilization, you should ask, you know, we can ask, do we have a collective lack project? And I think we do. I think it's been our emphasis on progress and in unlimited growth and uh, more and more. But as I like to say, why is more and more always better if it can never be enough? So I think the challenge today is seeing and seeing through that kind of collective lack project and seeing how it is alienating us further from our non-duality with the rest of the natural world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you today, David. Thank you so much for joining me and taking the time to explore your work a bit. And yeah, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Well, thank you for your very good questions, Ethan. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm also going to take the opportunity just if, if people watching this find it interesting and they want to follow up, there's an awful lot of stuff on my website, davidloy.org. Uh, one word, David Loy. So uh, there's, there's plenty to follow up there if anyone wants to do that. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, sharing. And I will put that link in the description of the podcast and the YouTube description. So if you're listening, you can find it in the description. So Thank thanks you, again. Ethan. And uh, thanks again for this opportunity. Absolutely. Keep up the good work.